Welcome, I welcome you all to this 12th lecture in this course Introduction to Paninian Grammar. So far we have studied the very basics of Paninian Grammar, the core text on which this tradition is based and certain related aspects. We have also studied the difference between the object language and the meta language. And in case of Paninian grammar, we observed that the object language that is the language to be described is Sanskrit and the language in which the grammar is written is also Sanskrit. However, we noted that there are some differences. We also noted that these differences are the additional differences, which means that certain features which exist in the object language, they are also used in the meta language. But in addition to that, these three features are used in the meta language. That is what makes this meta language different. Now in this lecture, we shall study the third difference between the object language and the meta language. And that difference is the technique of Pratyahar. To recap, we have noted that there are three differences in the meta language of Paninian grammar from the object language Sanskrit. They are the meaning of a word. And here we noted that in the object language, a word conveys meaning which is of two kinds, meaning meaning and also the word form. And in the object language, it is the meaning meaning which becomes predominant head main, whereas the word form which is part of the meaning becomes subordinate qualifier. And in the meta language of Panini, we observe that it is this word form meaning which becomes the main or the head and the meaning meaning becomes subordinate or qualifier <coughs> or modifier. Then we also studied the meaning of the cases. Here we said that the meaning of the cases as found in the object language, they are continued in the meta language also. In addition, there are three specific different meanings assigned to different cases, notably fifth, sixth and the seventh case and also the first case when in combination with the sixth case. We noted these meanings, we said that <coughs> these different meanings follow the first fundamental principle which differentiates between the object language and the meta language mentioned also on this slide the meaning of a word. So if in the meta language it is the word form which is going to be main or the head obviously it flows from that that the meaning of the cases would be in correspondence with it. So the fifth case which is translated using the word from in the object language is translated as immediately after in the meta language. The sixth case which is translated in the object language by using the word of is translated by using the word in place of or instead of in the meta language. And the seventh case 
which is translated in the object language you by using the words in or on is translated as immediately before as far as meta language is concerned. We have looked at various examples illustrating all these points. We also noted that the first case when in, when in combination with the sixth case means a substitute. So, a substitute which comes in place of something x substitutes y and so on and so forth. After looking at these metalinguistic features, we also look at the systemic point of view. How does this get translated into the system of Paninian grammar? And now we come to the third unique difference between the object language and the meta language, namely the technique of pratyahar. This will be the topic of today's lecture. This is the third difference, the technique of pratyahar. What is a pratyahar? Pratyahar is a technical term used in the Ashtadhyayi to denote a set of sounds undergoing certain grammatical operation in a concise manner. And this does not mean that the word pratyahara is used in the grammar of Panini, but pratyahara stands for certain technical terms that are used in the grammar of Panini Ashtadhyayi and they denote a set of sounds undergoing certain grammatical operation in a concise manner. And there are 41 such terms that are used in Paninian grammar. For example, ach, ach, jhal, jhash, jash, ik and yan. We have come across these terms when we looked at the examples illustrating the use of cases and their meanings in the previous lecture. The fifth case, sixth case and the seventh case. We have come across these words. These are the technical terms and at that time we said that the meaning of these terms will be clear in the later lectures. These are the technical terms which are called pratyahara. The next question is how are these terms formed? Ak, ach, etc. And these are not the features of the object language. Now, there is a particular methodology, particular process which is used to form the pratyahara. And the methodology is described on this particular slide. So, first you pick up a final sound which is termed as it and what is it will be clear later on. Let me repeat, by picking up a final sound which is termed as it and placing it in front of you or on paper somewhere, then selecting any sound that comes previous to it and then placing it before this it and now joining both together such terms are formed ak, ach, h, etc. And these are the pratyaharas. So, doing this entire process makes a pratyahara. And this is what is informed also by the sutra of Panini Adi Rantyena Saheta which is 1171. And now let us look at the meaning of this sutra. Let us first of all look at the words that are part of the sutra. And there are four words in this sutra. Adihi, Antena, Sah and Ita. Adihi means a beginning sound. Antena means by the final. Sah means together with. And ita means with it and then having put all these things together, 
we can say that the final it which is joined with a beginning letter any letter that is previous to it this term gets formed which is called the pratyahar let me also tell you that the word pratyahara is also used in the yoga sutras of patanjali as one of the eight limbs which primarily explains the concept of contraction contracting the cognitive apparatus through the sense organs and so on delimiting it something similar is also present in this technique of pratyahara used in the meta language of panini now the next question is what is an it it is a marker which has a purely meta linguistic function and it is not part of the object language and it is not a part of the object language literally it means one who goes one who goes away and we shall deal with this concept in detail when we will also look at certain sutras which define what it is suffice it to say here for our present purpose that it is together with the final sound which is it any previous letter joined together thus forms the pratyahar so here is an example what is an it and this is the relevant sutra and we shall see these in detail later on the sutra is halantyam this sutra is 1.3.3 and it consists of two words hal and antyam hal stands for a consonant how this will be clear later on antyam is final so what this sutra means is in the meta language a final consonant is termed as it so once this definition is clear now we can apply 1171 and form the pratyahara now what does all this presuppose the sutras that define pratyahara the sutras that define it and so on and so forth what does this presuppose it presupposes an existing set of sounds arranged in such a manner where at the end of each subset will appear a consonant which can be termed as it using 133 which can be then used to formulate the technical terms called pratyahara by 1171 and these pratyaharas will denote the set of sounds undergoing a particular grammatical operation let me read these 14 sutras here ayun ruluk eong ay auch hayavarat lan yamangananam झ भय घनरली दीज आर रिसाइटेड इन अ पर्टिक्युलर स्पीड एंड लेट मी रिसाइट देम एट वन गो विदाउट स्टॉपिंग इन बिट्वीन दे आर अयुण रुलुक एओंग अयउच हयावरट लण यमंगणनम झभाई घडधश जबगडदश खफछठथ चटतव कपै शशसर एंड हल दीज आर दोस 14 सूत्रस व्हिच आर द बैकग्राउंड ऑफ द सूत्रस डिफाइनिंग इट एज वेल एज द प्रत्याहारस दीज 14 सूत्रस आर कॉल्ड प्रत्याहार सूत्र बिकॉज दीज आर यूज्ड to form the pratyaharas they are also called varna sutra because these 14 sutras enumerate basic sounds 
They are also known as Chaturdasha Sutra because these are 14 sutras. They are also known as Shiva Sutras because these were conceived from the inspiration of God Shiva. They are also known as Maheshwara Sutras because these were conceived from the inspiration of God Shiva also known as Maheshwara in which a mythological story comes in which says that these were conceived in this particular fashion. This story is described in detail in the Nandikeshwara Kashika. So these are the various names with which these 14 sutras are referred to. They are also known as Akshara Samamnaya, Varana Samamnaya, etc. Now, let us look at the it in these 14 sutras. Applying 133, we see that ana is it in the first sutra, k is it in the second, ng which appears at the end is it in the third sutra, ch in the fourth, t in the fifth, ana in the sixth, ma in seventh, y in eighth, sh in ninth, sh in tenth, v in eleventh, y in twelfth, r in thirteenth, and L in the 14th Sutra. So here we have 14 sounds which can be straight away marked as it. So these are the its primarily. These are the its. <clears throat> now if we compare these 14 Sutras with the traditional sound inventory we will note various points. Now here is the traditional sound inventory for you. In the first row you see all the vowels. These vowels are part of the 14 sutras that we saw just now. Now then comes the arrangement of the consonants. This is how the consonants are arranged in the traditional sound inventory also known as matrika patha. Now these 5 rows and 5 columns give us 25 consonants. So these are called the sparsha consonants and we shall look at the description of these sounds in detail when we look at the process of speech production. Right now we can only say that there are 5 columns, each column mentioned as C1, C2, C3, C4 and C5 and there are 5 rows R1, R2, R3, R4 and R5. So each and every consonant can be referred to by this notation R1, C1, R1, C2 and so on and so forth. We can also refer to consonants vertically by referring to the column in which they are put. This particular arrangement of sounds is based on certain scientific principles namely the rows are arranged on the basis of the place of articulation of the sounds and the columns are arranged on the basis of the effort required for articulation of sounds. On these two bases we see that the traditional sound inventory arranges sounds in this particular fashion. K kh, g, gh, ng, ch, ch, j, j, y, t, th, d, dh, n, t, th, d, dh, n, and p, ph, b, bh, m. These are the 25 class consonants as they are called. Next we have 4 consonants y, V, R and L, these are called semi vowels. And finally, we have SH, SH, S and H. These are called the fricatives or the sibilants. Now, this is what a traditional inventory of sounds looks like. And if we cl take a closer look 
at the 14 sutras we see that these are rearranged in a particular peculiar fashion. So, if we compare these two the 14 sutras and the traditional sound inventory we can discuss the sutras in terms of the sound inventory. So, if we look at the first four sutras namely Ayun, Ruluk, Aeong and Ayauch these four sutras consist of vowels arranged in accordance with their places of articulation and what these are will be clear when we go to the process of speech production. But we can say here that the first four sutras can be said to describe the vowels that are part of the traditional sound inventory. <clears throat> then if we look at sutras 5 and 6 namely Hayavarat and Lund, we can say that these sutras consist of semi vowels y, v, r and l. In addition to them there is h as well. This is what sutras 5 and 6 consist of. If we look at sutra number 7, it is yamangana nam, it is nothing but the nasal consonants. These are part of different classes representing different places of articulation. Now these sounds they form the fifth column representing the effort of articulation. All these sounds ya, ma, na, 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 these sounds form the part of the fifth column in the traditional sound inventory with some rearrangement. Then if we look at sutras 8 and 9, they are jhabhai and gharhadhash, jhabhai and gharhadhash. These two sutras consist of fourth of the class consonants from each of the class representing the place of articulation which is the row. But now these consonants, these sounds they form the fourth column representing the effort of articulation of these sounds. So, this effort of articulation will be made clear when we study the process of speech production. Right now we observe that these two sutras consist of consonants which are part of the fourth column in the traditional sound inventory. Then we look at sutra number 10. This is Jabagada Dash. Jabagada Dash. This sutra consists of the third of the class consonants from each of the class representing the place of articulation that is described by the row. And these five consonants, these are the sounds, they form the third column based on the effort of articulation. That is what is described in this particular sutra, the third column from the sound inventory. Then we go to the description of sutras 11 and 12. This consists of kapha chathath chathatav kapai. Kapha chathath is put in green and the rest in the black primarily because these two sutras consist of the second and the first of the class consonants from each class representing the place of articulation. The green sounds they are the second of the class consonants and the remaining ones are the first of the class consonants. These sounds form the second and first column representing the place of articulation. This is their uniqueness. Kapha chathatha chatav tau and kapai. Now kapha chathatha and chathatha they are made of one sutra and kapha is part of the second sutra. We will look at the purpose of this distinction little later. 
Now let us look at the remaining two sutras 13th and 14th. <clears throat> These two sutras they are Shashya Sar and Hal. Shashya Sar and Hal. These two sutras consist of the sibilant sounds or the fricatives as they are also called. So this is the description of these 14 sutras in comparison with the traditional sound inventory. And I request you to take note of this pattern of description because in the examination we will use both these notations. We may ask you to form the pratyaharas using the row and column information or we may also ask you to explain a particular pratyahara in terms of the rows and the columns that get described by that particular pratyahara. So this is in a nutshell the description of the 14 sutras that are used by Panini at the beginning of his grammar. And these 14 sutras can be compared with the traditional sound inventory and the traditional sound inventory can be described in terms of these 14 sutras. We also note that the sounds are rearranged. In the traditional sound inventory, we start the consonants from k, kh, g, gh, ng and there is a row wise arrangement that is how we read it. In this particular set of sounds known as 14 sutras, we however see that the arrangement is different. It is primarily the column wise arrangement and the purpose will become clear later on. Now as is our practice, we shall look at the Mangala Charana. But before that, let me summarize. In this today's lecture, we have seen, we have studied the concept of it with one sutra defining it which is useful to form the pratyahara. We have also seen the sutra which defines, which tells us how to form a pratyahara. After that we looked at the sound inventory which gets converted into the 14 sutras and then we looked at the correspondence between the 14 sutras and the traditional sound inventory. We also noted the notation used in terms of the class consonants where they can be described using a particular row and the column. And now we shall study how the pratyaharas get formed together with the explanation and with some examples in the next lecture. Let us now conclude today's lecture with the normal practice of reading the Mangala Charana from one of the texts of Paninian grammar. This Mangala Charana is taken from a text called Madhaviya Dhatuvritti which was composed by Madhava in around 14th century CE. This reads Vagi Shadya Sumanasaha Sarvarthanam Upakrame Yan Natva Kritakrityasyus Tam Namami Prahaspatim. I'll repeat Vagi Shadya Sumanasaha Sarvarthanam Upakrame Yan Natva Kritakrityasyuhu Tam Namami Prahaspatim. And as is also our practice, we will read the 5 sutras from 2.2 beginning. They are as follows. Purva paradharottara mekadeshi naikadhi karane ardham napum sakam dvitiya trutiya chaturtha turyanyanya tarasyam praptapanne chad dvitiyaya kalah parimanina. I repeat. Purva para dharottara mekadeshi naikadhi karane ardham napum sakam dvitiya trutiya chaturtha turyanyanya tarasyam praptapanne chad dvitiyaya and kalah parimanina. Thank you.